So often we hear that biodiversity is essential to sustain natural ecosystems on which humans, and I suppose pretty much all human life depend. But I don't think the majority of us fully comprehend what that really means. Sure, we understand that ecosystems are the physical environments, such as your land, your air, and your water, um, interfacing with organisms to sustain themselves, and that for ecosystems to be healthy, biodiversity is critical. But I don't think that most of us fully appreciate the direct and indirect benefits that are delivered by biodiversity and ecosystem services, or, you know, or ecosystems to mankind. And these benefits that I mentioned are better known as ecosystem services. And what these do is they provide people with raw materials for creating conditions for income, mental health, physical health, regulating climate, water, pollution, and disease. And, in the, and I think in the specific case of biodiversity, we miss that this is the engine that allows ecosystems to thrive and for these ecosystem um, services that I mentioned to remain active. Without biodiversity, there's, um, forests can become deserts, reefs can become lifeless rocks, even in the absence of a cataclysmic event. Biodiversity really is the key element in building the resilience to ecosystems to any sort of change. Kim Preshwolf, Nat Geo certified educator and TED innovation educator, eloquently describes biodiversity as a blanket woven from an unremitting threat, a series of three fundamental threats. Ecosystems diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity. Now, the more intertwining there is between these threats, the denser, stronger, and more resilient our biodiversity blanket becomes. So naturally, as we pull on these threads, we inevitably are weakening our biodiversity blanket. And biodiversity has broad societal implications. In agriculture, biodiversity is necessary for productivity and viability. Biodiverse conditions mean ample pollinators, species variety, um, and enhanced water and soil quality. And in biodiversity in marine ecosystems is critical because the ocean is an important source of food, as fish account for 17% of global meat consumption. Coastal mangroves, wetlands, uh, reefs, um, all reduce erosion, storm damage, and you know, really filtering runoff from the land and serve as nurseries to fish. And biodiverse uh, land and sea habitats are critical carbon sinks. Historically, they've been able to pull up to 59% of carbon dioxide emissions out of the atmosphere. But these natural carbon sinks are projected to be less effective and slowing down the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the end of the century under medium and high emissions scenarios. So what does this really mean? Well, at the rapid rate at which that biodiversity is being lost, we, it means that we are inevitably risking um, you know, the services that we are getting from the ecosystems, those ecosystem services. Biodiversity loss is amongst the top global risks to society. In fact, the, um, the World Economic Forum Global Risk Reports ranks biodiversity loss as the third most severe risk at a global scale over the next 10 years. The planet is now officially facing its sixth mass extinction with the consequences that will affect all life on Earth, but not now, but for millions of years to come. Humans have destroyed vast areas of the world's terrestrial, marine, and aquatic ecosystems. Natural forests declined by 6.5 million hectares you know, between the year of 2010 to 2015, and this is a, a land area that's greater than the UK. Over 30% of corals and vertebrates, sorry, over 30% of corals are now at risk of bleaching, and over 60% of vertebrate populations have disappeared since 1970. So those are pretty scary stats. So we can see that what we're doing to the planet. And these, uh, these striking changes are all driven by land use change, over exploitation of natural resources, overpopulation, invasive alien species, and climate change. And I think these are all you know, things that you've heard of, terms that you're familiar with. And if we lose biodiversity and the related ecosystem services, that, you know, is the, that are delivered to us, this means that we have to create artificial processes to mimic these naturally occurring processes. 
the services. And this is where the economic invisibility of biodiversity comes in. Just because Mother, Mother Nature doesn't invoice us directly, you know, for these services, it doesn't mean that they don't come at a cost. So always have that in the back of your mind. Like, even though there isn't a back office where Mother Nature is delivering these invoices, it does come at a cost that is going to catch up to us at a later stage. And there are various, you know, sort of ecosystem accounting methodologies aimed at calculating and quantifying these ecosystem services. Um, and what these do is they really, they organize data and habitats and landscapes, and they measure the ecosystem services, and they track the changes in the ecosystem assets, and link these to information such as economic and human activity to kind of quantify um, and bring a financial value that you know, we can understand. However, don't be worried. I know everyone's like, oh, she's a scientist, she's going into scientific, <laughs> scientific mode. I'm not here today, you know, to confuse you with technical methodologies on how to quantify things in rands and cents, um, because these, realistically, these are invaluable services. Um, what I really want is I simply want every person in this room to leave with a basic understanding that these services are not for free. And if we continue to misuse them at the exceptional rates that we are, um, you know, we're really forcing ourselves into a situation where we're going to be in economic disarray as we grapple uh, with the financial cost of replicating these. So that should be your key takeaway today, is that when you go home, these resources are not forever, these services are not forever. They do come at a cost, and we are, you know, we've gone into a phase where we are now at risk of completely not having them at our disposal. So to keep it simple and to avoid the technical methodologies on the accounting um, and you know of quantifying these uh, ecosystem services, I want to really illustrate my point by making a very basic example that will define the principle. Um, a scientific study that was carried out in Switzerland investigated pollination by comparing a sample that had access to pollinators like these and another sample that didn't have access to the pollinators. Um, really just to understand the difference in the yields that were produced. The recorded differences in the yields that had, um, you know, the, oh, sorry. And then what, what, what the investigation did is they took the records um, and the differences and they were extrapolated into a scale so you could provide a, a, a regional view, um, a landscape view, and a country view. Right. And then this, I mean, the results of the study um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, but obviously, they, they, they're variables that affect these estimates, and these were considered. But the results that my mind keeps running to, that I'm trying to share with you guys, is that the sample that had the pollinators delivered had a substantially greater crop yield than the sample that didn't have the pollinators. And in, in addition, the study uh, valued the pollination of one beehive um, at in Switzerland as $1,050. And the value that the beekeeper gets out of the beehive and the beeswax um, and the honey at about at $215. So if you do the math, the beehive was producing five times the value of two in terms of increasing the yields of the plants simply just from bees buzzing back and forth and you're getting pollen and nectar. And if you take these sorts of numbers and estimations at scale, the total economic value of pollination alone is 153 billion euros, which at the time of the study means that this was 10% of the world's agricultural output, purely just from biodiversity um, through, obviously, um, pollination. And if one considers the alarming rate at which bee populations are declining, it becomes clear pretty quickly that the world is at risk of losing pollination and ecosystem services. And with 75% of the world's crops relying on insect pollination for yields, quality, and quantity, the absence of this natural pollination will result, will result in risk of you know, compromised food security, the, you know, the likelihood of prices being uh, substantially increased, and food security, and also certain types of food becoming very scarce. And what is the most, you know, probably the most alarming is that this case study was conducted in 2011. Whereas more recent studies conducted by the World Bank estimate that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia um, could forego about 9.7 to 6.5 of their total GDP 
annually by, 30, by 2013. These are really scary numbers. So I think it's really important that we need to start taking this into context. And in addition, um, a, a, a total of 235 to 577 billion dollar annual crop output could be lost in the absence of pollination. But remember, another scary fact, these are all examples that just relate to pollination, whereas we are at risk of losing countless um, ecosystem services. So the, the, these numbers are just one aspect that we're talking about today. So life will really become exceptionally costly and difficult as the surge you know, of the cost of living becomes really difficult to grapple with as the availability of these resources starts to decline, as they are already. But the benefits um, and the benefits derived from biodiversity and ecosystem services are, cons you know, they are considerable, but systemically, these services have been either undervalued or unvalued in, you know, your day-to-day -day decisions, your market prices, and your economic accounting. And although they may be silenced, they certainly aren't invisible and they certainly aren't free. And if you wish to continue benefiting from these services, then maybe we should start taking uh, biodiversity a little bit more seriously. You know, it's, it's not possible to survive on this earth without biodiversity. So we need to value the true cost a little bit differently. Every day we use materials from the earth without thinking what it's doing and what the true cost is. But what if we had to pay for these our valuable resources and pay for the true cost of these valuable resources? Would it make us more careful about what we use or better, you know, yet what we misuse? Because we're quite wasteful. And, you know, we talk about things like the SDGs, um, access to food, access to water and health for all, but how can we realistically achieve all of those goals without biodiversity? The simple truth is, we all have a responsibility as big corporates, as communities, as small businesses, as families, as you, yes you, as an individual, to rethink how we use, and like I said earlier, how we misuse you know, these resources that we provide, uh, that we are provided by nature. Because if we don't do that, then we're gonna to get to a situation when we've pulled so much of those intertwined threads from our biodiversity blankets that it can no longer serve us and protect us. Thank you.